Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Sumdahl. I am the director of the Office of Deaf Services with the Alabama Department of Mental Health. My responsibilities include making sure that my staff are doing their work now. I, I, let me clarify on that one here. Um, I oversee the staff work, uh, people who work direct and indirectly with deaf and hard of hearing individuals over the state. I'm also, I also oversee to make sure that uh, they're doing their jobs appropriately, providing support, but also doing some work with uh, the department here on policy development, standards of care, to make sure that the services that we have include cultural and linguistic properties accessibility for our consumers who are deaf and hard of hearing in the state. Um, we provide consultation, provide workshops, uh, and provide support for the different programs departments within the department within ADMH. Uh, if a deaf person were to show up in their at their front door, how would they approach to work with them? In general, I, I would say that um, people think will say things like, "You're a deaf person; you can hear if you want to." Or the deaf person should not be able to own property, should not be able to get married, not be able to get a job, can't have children even. And that's a general misconception. Related to mental health specifically, there's a tendency to not realize that deaf individuals have their own culture, their own language, their own methods of communication, and they're easily misunderstood. There's a lot of misconceptions that, that come into play, Very you know, a lot of assumptions that come into play rather than seeking clarity. My name is Brian McKinney. Uh, I'm the Region 4 Interpreter Coordinator. One, we provide interpreter services for those consumers uh, working for the Department of Mental Health and our community mental health centers uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing and use sign language as their primary mode of communication. Specifically with mental health, we found that approaching deafness not from a disability standpoint, but from a cultural and linguistic minority providing appropriate services, uh, providing affirmative services to those individuals uh, in their preferred language, whether it be through an interpreter or through a direct services like one of our many sign fluent and deaf therapists. It's been very effective. So when I first moved here, I was working with our deaf unit, the Bailey Deaf Unit at Greel Hospital prior to its closing. And it was just being able to sit into a situation like that where it hadn't really been done before um, and to see the success that came from it. Uh, just to see that we for a long time said, this is going to work, this works really well, but we didn't have the evidence to do so. We were getting the evidence to do so. Hello, my name is Shannon Reese and I'm the statewide services coordinator for the Office of Deaf Services. Well, I work a lot with our staff and I receive intake calls as the first point of contact. For individuals in the community who need services, um, I refer them to their specific county and to the regional therapists and interpreters. Sometimes we have parents who call who need assistance with their kids or they don't know what resources are available for individuals who are deaf within the mental health system. Also, I'm responsible for the sign language proficiency interview where we assess individuals' sign language skills. And I'm responsible for providing CEUs for NBCC and the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. And um, I coordinate a mental health online training every two months. And on top of all of that, I stay busy. <laughs> Remember, not all deaf people are the same. They have varying levels of communication, of language, deprivation, proficiencies. Some of them just need interpreting services for their psychiatric appointments. Some of them want therapy through our deaf therapist. All of our therapist signs, but we do have sign, but we do have interpreters available. Uh, maybe they need group home level work or you know different mental health services. 
A regional therapist are important because they understand what it's like to be deaf. They already have that connection. And people, of course, think we know everything about deaf people, but even we don't. And each of our uh, staff have various fields and expertise areas. And it's just important to remember not one size fits all. Hi, I'm Mary Ogden, and I work for the Office of Deaf Services as their uh, ASA, and I mainly focus on travel. We have 17 staff members throughout the state, and my people travel every day to several locations every day. So it's a lot of travel papers and a lot of paper pushing. When I was young, I was at a play and there was a little boy in my room, I was little too, and I saw his mom signing to him because someone he knew was in the play and they came to see him and I was so intrigued by that and so I, I slowly gathered up, you know, some minor skill in it but I always had an interest in deaf culture and all the bases that we were stationed at, I would go to their monthly socials because mostly every state and city has a deaf social somewhere. I'm Charlene Crump and I'm the state coordinator for communication access and training with the Office of Deaf Services. Well, when we work with individuals such as therapists who don't sign, um, interpreters become an integral part of that. And because these two individuals are not used to working together, and usually their training is very different. A lot of people assume that interpreters just need to have competencies in English and American Sign Language, but when they work in mental health, they also have to learn a lot about how mental health works. Um, a lot of our training and standards are actually based on the crux of that relationship. For example, with mental health diagnoses, uh, an interpreter and even the hearing therapist have to know the difference between symptomology of mental health, uh, language disfluency, language deprivation, comorbid neurological sequela that's a result of etiology of deafness, fund of information deficits, and then what's normal and not normal for individuals who are deaf. So we have to be able to factor in to all, all of those considerations because each and every one of those can look like symptoms of mental health. So by using instruments like our communication skills assessment, we can start to suss out some of those differences to make sure that deaf people get the treatment that they need and that's appropriate. I think it's unfair in some ways to pick a favorite. Um, I'm that person that never likes to pick my favorite type of ice cream because let's face it, they're all good, right? Um, and I think my career with Department of Mental Health, I've, I've had a lot of um, really remarkable experiences here that I appreciate and I'm thankful for. If I have to pick one, it would probably just be the fact that I was able to be here from the very beginning and to be part of building the program from the ground up. Um, to come into a program that had practically non-existent services for individuals who were deaf, to now being um, the national benchmark in a lot of areas for deaf services, our uh, clinicians and the quality of work that they give, our interpreters who are qualified mental health interpreters. We run a national certification for individuals who are interpreters wanting to become specialized in the field of mental health. And we even have other states whose laws are written for qualified mental health interpreters that are based on our work and specifically require them to have our certification. Um, you know, being involved in practicums and linkage agreements with universities, being involved in the development and use of a communication skills assessment, and just seeing all of those things come to fruition and see where it started and, and where it is now. There's a few I can think of right now, but let me pick two. One, uh, in general, hearing individuals are not accustomed to adapting their way of communication, adapting their way of talking, listening. They're not used to having to change things. So when they meet an individual who's deaf, they get nervous. They, they send to sit back and it's like, I, how can I do this? Instead of taking the challenge up there, trying something, try, considering different ways, 
they instead shut down, may shun away from the person being served, uh, turn them away even sometimes. That is one challenge that we do see. Another challenge that we encounter is deaf individuals have been so used to being oppressed throughout their lives and just to, as an aspect of daily life, then when they go into a mental health center and go into services in general, they expect the oppression. They go in, they look around, hearing people talking everywhere. But then there's some centers out there, some departments that have maybe a person who can sign a little bit or try something just a little bit, and they see a deaf therapist, they see an interpreter, they see these individual things, that changes their, their attitude very quickly. Uh, they try to, people are trying to communicate with me as a deaf person. It, it really opens up access to service. It opens so many doors.